child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me my own. The first reading comes from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor, along the route to the Red Sea, to go around Eden. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Psalms chapter 107, verses 1 through 9. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those He redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to the city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. 
Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. This is the word of the Lord. The third reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. 
As the context for our gospel reading this week is Nicodemus and uh, Jesus' conversation in the dark of night with Nicodemus. Yes, he's a teacher, <laughs> but he doesn't quite understand it all. Uh, similarly to the disciples oftentimes, uh, but at the same token here, as Nicodemus meets with Jesus in the dark of night, Jesus is responding to him and saying, look, unless you are begotten from above, if you are, if, if you are begotten from water and the spirit, and then again in verse 7, begotten, it is necessary to be begotten from above. Uh, and that's the pretext of the gospel this week in John chapter 3, this reality that we have to be made new. And God makes us new. Thankfully, it's his work. We hear this all throughout John's gospel. And it is for us to know the truth, right? This is a message. And live in the light. Because being next to the light, living in the light, living in the word of God is important for what it means to be Christian. Well, so that takes us to our text. And as the text said, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, in this way also the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes might in him have eternal life. This is how God loves the world. So you've got this picture right before the most notable verse of the Bible, John three sixteen, that is associated directly with Numbers 21. So what happens in Numbers 21? Well, the children of Israel had been freed from Egypt. And they had been wandering in the desert for decades now. They're getting closer to where the promised land entry will be and the timing of that, but they're tired. They're tired of what's going on. They're tired of the manna, this honey bread from heaven. Uh, they want something more substantive. If we were to look back at that scripture, we could see that they're just whining and complaining. It's, why have you taken us out here, Moses and God? You two did this to us. <laughs> all right. Well, have you ever whined and complained? I mean, we've all done that, haven't we? And, uh, and yet, why is that? Well, because we want it our way. We want life and everything the way we want it, and we want it now. And yet, we have to be reborn from above, begotten from above, right? If we remain in the darkness of our sin or sin nature or the twisted thinking, God's wrath is on us. But as he brings us to the light, as he brings us to his light, and how does he promise to do that? Through baptism. As we are buried with Christ and raised to new life, we're given the indwelling Holy Spirit to deal with us every day uh, until he takes us home. And we're given the righteous robe of Christ so that when God sees us, he sees his dearly beloved child, not an object of wrath any longer, but his adopted child, an object of love. When he deals with us with his law and gospel word, he sheds light on the subject. And so you're complaining? Stop it. <laughs> I don't know why God has us in these circumstances right now. But we can't say he doesn't. We should pray for our leaders. We should pray for those around us. And we should ask Christ to bring his heaven on earth, which is an otherworldliness. It's an otherness. It's where we look at the others around us and put them first. But this begotten of water and spirit is what Jesus was talking about. And this is the start of God's relationship with us. To be bathed in the font of spiritual regeneration is to look upon the spiritual snake of the crucified and so be healed from the venomous bite of sin to be freed from death and to receive eternal life. Why? Because that's God's will. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world through Jesus Christ by being lifted up on the cross for you, for me. And it's in that lifting up that, that we have healing. 
Strangely enough, when these venomous snakes were sent to God's people wandering in the wilderness, the wise staters, all right, they bit them, and the people were told to do something quite strange. They were pleading with Moses to go to God in prayer for them, like he had always done. And God said, okay, get a pole and fashion a bronze snake. Now, I don't care how you number the Ten Commandments, whether it's one or two, but somewhere you're going to find that making something of an image, like Romans 1 talks about, an image of a reptile or an image of anything, is idolatry. It's not good. And yet, this is a type, a typology of Jesus and the saving grace that God would have. And it would cause, it would enable, it would bring faith. Why? Because it's not reasonable. I mean, look, you get bit by a venomous snake. Okay, um, call 911, right? I mean, that's what our human capacity says. Of course, there's no 911 back there in the wilderness for God's people. But so they have to turn to him. All right. But this doesn't even make good sense according to uh, Exodus 20, right? We should fashion no image of anything in heaven or earth below. And worship that, but it wasn't worshiping. All right, there was this act of faith that the people were called to have in faith to look to what Moses, their leader, uh, made. And in that faith, they would be healed from their sin and grumbling. Okay, the lifting up of the bronze snake by Moses placed in the midst of the wilderness people an act of God that confronted them with a crisis, demanded faith or disbelief, life or death, and it was placed right there before them. Now, this wouldn't be the last time, all right? In Joshua's day in chapter 1, today choose life. They had, they had the either or then. In fact, today we who are graced by God's presence in word and sacrament, we have a choice too. We can turn. We can walk the other way. We can run and hide. But Jesus says, look at me, because I am the one who has come for you. You see, as the lifting of the snake was necessary for the healing of sinful people, so, Jesus teaches, is the lifting of the Son of Man necessary for the salvation of the world. You see, in him, we are saved, we are kept, we are cradled through his life, death, and resurrection for you. And it, well, it doesn't really end there either. The mystery of John's gospel is that there's even more. The more is kind of troubling because... The way that we read this in John's gospel is that actually the time of glory for Jesus is not when you and I would prefigure it to be. It's not at the empty tomb. It's actually, and we'll get into this more next week in chapel, in Mark chapter 10, it's actually at the cross. You see, this is why God's ways are different than ours. This is why his ways are higher not just literally on a ball, but figuratively because they don't make sense to our rational capabilities. How can it be that dying on a cross when you've led the perfect good life can be better and can be the glory moment of the creator of the universe? Does that make any sense? Well, not to our rational minds, of course not. But the crucifixion, is the exaltation of Christ in John's gospel. It's not a transition to glory. It, in fact, is the glory. The exaltation of the Son of Man is itself the crucifixion. And the crucifixion is itself the exaltation of the Son of Man. The cross assumes the throne of majesty at God's right hand, so that the rule of God is actually from the cross. The throne of God is from the cross. And so this way of Jesus is different, but it's good. Attached to it is all his promises. Let's pray. Father, our ways often get us into trouble and difficulty, 
The feeling of the circumstances of the world around us is troubling today for sure. And yet, you have given us a greater way, a better way, a way that puts others first, which we'll hear more about next week in Mark chapter 10. But at the same time, what we know is that your way has to be believed. It comes from your word. And you say that putting others first, in spite of our considerations and concerns, is most important. God, we can't do that easily, if at all. We need your help. Forgive us, encourage us, strengthen us, save us. In Jesus' name, amen. In God's mercy, he has sent his son to be lifted up to that place of glory, crucifixion, for you, for your behalf. And in your repentance and mine, you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Students of Lutheran High School, Laverne. I am Pastor Mason Okubo. I'm the executive director, the acting executive director here at Lutheran High. I want to say, I just want to say a few words that I am so glad to finally have you here on campus. We have all been working very hard to get you here, uh, st uh, staff, faculty, uh, to get you back here safely, okay? Because we want you to be here. We absolutely want you to be here. Now, in that light, I am asking everyone to please follow the COVID protocols, masks, 
uh, social distancing, uh, listen to your teachers and stuff, all right? Simply because the next two weeks are going to be very critical, very, very critical, because frankly, we're on the radar of the uh, LA County Health Department. So please help us out, okay? I want to continue staying open. I pray that we continue to be in the, that the red tier, that we finally go down to the lower tiers and we can perhaps maybe loosen up. But like I said, these first two weeks are, are very critical. All right. In any case, uh, I do want to share a word of God with you. I know that for many of us, we're undergoing a lot of trials and tribulations, struggles in our lives. And sometimes you can ask, Lord, where are you in all this? I want to share with you a word of encouragement. St. Paul, God had given him a thorn in his side. You all know this story. He had a thorn in his side. Three times he prayed to God, Lord, remove this thorn in his side. We're not quite sure what it is, but it's a, it's, it was a, a trouble that he had. God says to him and says, my, your, my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. So no matter what it is that you struggle, know that it is not your power that's going to bring about God's way. It will be God who works in your weakness. So despite the troubles that you have, despite the uh, problems that you have, some days we have to accept them. This is just the way a sinful world works. But know that even in your worst times, God can, God's power can manifest itself. Many times you may not even notice. But God's power is made perfect even in your weakness. God bless you all. I hope you have a wonderful day today.